This is Rebecca Roth, and I'm going to do something a little bit different here for the next uh, probably five weeks or so. So if you're listening uh, on Spreaker.com, on Vimeo.com, I think we're on iTunes and also SoundCloud, um, you probably haven't heard these before. Uh, this is a program that I did for my Christmas vacation, holidays, um, and I did a 10-part uh, series, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do for each Saturday here is give you part one and two. Uh, if you uh, want to go to my membership site, you can listen to all of them if you just can't wait, but that's, that's how I'm going to get them out there publicly. Um, uh, next week I'll do part uh, three and four, and then five and six, and then seven and eight, until we get to all ten. And what I did was I kind of took uh, uh, my members, actually. This was a, a, a kind of a holiday uh, gift, in, in a sense. I was able to pre-record these so I could have them uploaded. So every day, uh, the membership site, instead of getting the news over the Christmas holiday... Uh, they got uh, deeper into 9-11 from inside the airlines uh, perspective. So I uh, flew for more than 30 years, and uh, I believed it every, everything that they told me to until I found out that some of the hijackers were still alive. So I started looking, and as a result, I found uh, some huge discrepancies uh, according to uh, airline standards, FAA protocols, and that type of thing. As I continued looking, and I uh, published my first book in 2014, Methodical Illusion, and if you haven't read the series yet, there's now four of them. I'm working on the fifth as well as a nonfiction uh, using the Freedom of Information Act data and other uh, information and experience from a team, team of aviation experts that have joined me as a consequence of doing Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie on the first book, and I did another one with the fourth book, Methodical Exposure, just released last year. So if you're interested in really getting into the 9-11 story, so you really understand uh, what happened, you might want to read the novels. If you don't read novels, and I, I get a lot of email from people, I never read novels, but I read these, um, you can purchase them uh, autographed and personalized at my online bookstore and you can go to the dot com for each title methodical illusion methodical deception methodical conclusion and methodical exposure each one's a dot com and you can uh, go to the bookstore if you go to uh, behind the galley curtain dot com you can click on the main menu and it'll take you to the bookstore also and you can also order them on uh, Kindle at Amazon and, um, and from any bookstore, actually. You can just give them the author's name, Rebecca Roth, and the title of the books. You can find all the uh, numbers and everything you need uh, to order them. If you uh, prefer libraries, libraries will also order them for you. So if you don't like to accumulate books. What I'm finding, especially with airline people, but uh, a lot of the readers are reading through the first time, digesting, and then they go back with a highlighter because there's a lot of information. And there's a lot of stuff that I built into the story. And it's, it is a novel. So you be prepared for that. It's a novel. <laughs> and so I am not the main character, but the main character, Vera Hansen, is a protagonist. She's a combination of lots of people that I knew um, and still know. And now I'm still working with lots of people from United American Airlines and others, several others, uh, even international airlines that have brought forth more information and stories. So I think you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. It's a nice way of really touching with what really happened. And I think if you pay attention to what's been going on with the uh, Russia controlling our president hoax, you'll understand more how the CIA and the FBI cover each other and are able to pull off a coup d'etat or a hoax or uh, create something, send innocent people to jail and that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do is just give this introduction for each one of these and you'll hear the same thing each week. If you like to go deeper into 9-11, you can become a member at my membership site and it is behindthegalleycurtain.com. And it's as low as $4 a month. You can come in for one month uh, three months, six months, or 12 months. It's up to you how you want to go into that. I do a daily news, just 
really current event news stuff every day, breaking down some of the things that maybe the mainstream media doesn't talk about, are afraid to talk about, or may, quite frankly, sometimes are covering up. So I welcome you to join me over there. And for the next five weeks here on Spreaker, Vimeo.com, uh, SoundCloud, everywhere, uh, YouTube. Uh, YouTube, I, I usually don't mention because they've already taken my a uh, couple years of programs down, Saturday programs. And I and really what happened was I showed, I think this is actually uh, somewhere located in uh, the uh, <laughs> Spreaker, has all the audios from everything I've done. But uh, this was a uh, screen capture of inside the Freedom of Information Act data that I have about almost a terabyte of. So you could see that some of the files, like the terrorists supposedly voices, we have some planes, we're going back to the airport, were uploaded before the planes left Boston. So when I found stuff like that, I went, oh dear, well, we got to look a little bit deeper. And the things that I found have come out in the books, um, especially book three and four, because by that time, I had quite a team of aviation experts joining me, uh, and the stuff that we found was uh, pretty, let me just say this way, from an airline perspective, pretty frightening and pretty eye-opening. And, uh, and I can see the whole thing is unfolding again, how uh, the mainstream media, if you've never looked into Operation Mockingbird, you might want to do that. Uh, how they are very much controlled, and we, we were not necessarily given uh, anything even close to the truth about 9-11. So there you go. Without further ado, I will be attaching this video to part one and two. Next week, you'll probably hear the same thing to three and four and then five and six and down the line till all 10 of them are out there. Again, I hope you'll uh, consider joining us. We have a chat room there. And if you have any questions, when we talk about the daily news and things that are going on at behindthegalleycurtain.com. And here you go. All right, this is Rebecca Roth, and this is going to be our holiday special. It's going to be a little bit different than our daily show uh, because I want to uh, record these so that uh, Ramjet and I both can spend time with our families, our kids, our pets, <laughs> all those our things. Our golf clubs. <laughs> Christmas trees, uh, all of those things that we both have to do or want to do, actually, over the holidays. So what I'm going to do is record... Um, no, I don't know how many there's going to be, but let's just say the time a period between Christmas and New Year's, um, and that's about 10 days. So we're going to go in and we're going to talk about uh, just a little bit more in depth. And I think what I'd like to do is kind of start by uh, talking about the books in uh, and the information that was that kind of came through the novels in order so that we can you know, kind of, I can share some stuff with you guys. So, and we'll try to make these be about 30 minutes long. So, uh, you guys don't, I mean, if you're bored and you want to get away from your family and you want to hear the daily show, <laughs> you don't do Christmas, whatever, uh, then you, we won't take up all your time anyway. So we'll try to do this and that's what's going to happen. And this will be uh, number one. And, um, I'm not sure we'll title these something special, something, a deeper dive into 9-11, part one or something like that. So you're saying that these are people that don't do Christmas. Are these the nudist Buddhists you've been talking about <laughs> exactly. for the last Exactly. Exactly. If you're a nudist Buddhist, <laughs> it's winter out. You know, so they don't want to do anything. Um, so anyway, uh, first off, I guess, you know, I think I'll answer, I'll, I'll, I'll pose a question to myself and I'll answer that question. I know a lot of people have asked me this and a lot of people have a hard time uh, differentiating what is real? And some people have been get caught up. At, Am I Vera? Well, I'm not Grace. <laughs> so no. Um, so let me just kind of explain why did I write the books as a novel or a novel series, actually? Uh, and why did I do what I did at the beginning of Methodical Illusion? So uh, to answer that question, I really wanted uh, people to understand how uniquely different flight attendants are. And I know that um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention um, the gentleman that I uh, dedicated Methodical Exposure, the fourth book, to 
actually admitted this, and this is kind of a cute story, and I'll share it now because he's passed on. Um, but when somebody contacted him and told him about some of the information I had released in the first two books, and he did a little listening, and he couldn't believe that a, a flight attendant was smart enough to know about um, p -tech, number one, because p -tech, you'll remember, was the software company startup that Michael Chertoff had uh, really helped uh, this foreign-owned company get into uh, 22, I believe, U.S. government computer systems. Uh, and they were working at Edwards Air Force Base with DARPA on the remote control system since the mid to late 80s. So when he found that out, it was like, well, wait a minute, this is a flight attendant with brains. This is, I got to meet this person. Uh, so that the, what do you call that? The stereotypical <laughs> well, in other words, Mindset. He, in other words, he'd had Grace as a flight attendant <laughs> exactly. on all the flights he'd ever taken. That's possible. It is possible, but um, it's. It was, I got a good laugh out of it because, um, but before he actually he passed away this last spring, and and he actually admitted to this a, to me a couple times. But um, because I had gone so deep into this, and then we went through a lot of the FOIA data together and the radar and text, and I, I literally was teaching myself how to be an air traffic controller. And actually, it was something I thought I was going to do when I was in high school. I had, had looked into it as a career. So I was, you know, I had a draw to it anyway. But I was on taking online courses, so to speak, on how to get through all of this uh, FOIA data. So when we connected, uh, then he admitted a few times, you, you might be the smartest person I've met. And I've met a lot of astronauts <laughs> because he actually did a land some space shuttles and then have a uh, what do you call this, um, social time uh, at a place near Edwards Air Force Base called The Office with some of them where we would, you know, socialize and drink beer type of socializing uh, and tell stories. So uh, I always, I got a good laugh out of it. Well, you know, lots of careers, uh, you know, there are stereo stereotypical types of people. For example, programmers. You know, there's certain elements to programmers that are kind of all the same. Um, and they don't vary much. Flight attendants and pilots, I would think, are a vast variety of people. I mean, there is maybe a stereotypical type of flight attendant that you might think of, which is the grace type. But, you know, I think your experience has indicated that there are a vast array of people who become flight attendants anywhere from, you know, former morticians <laughs> to, uh, you know, uh, astrophysicists. Well, that's one reason why I wanted to uh, bring in the real part of the airline life. Uh, and really, I think, quite frankly, Vera is kind of a combination of several different people. She's stoic. Uh, she's uh, mature. She's, uh, she's a widow. So she's been around. She's senior in her, you know, scheduling abilities, and uh, she's nice to the younger, uh, more junior flight attendant, which I bring in is Grace. And Grace was uh, kind of a, a valley girl, you know, typical. All she was really interested in was finding a man with money and uh, getting jewelry and that sort of thing. And I think everybody knows those kind of people. It doesn't matter what. Uh, job you're in but they're there they're in, in the airline too but yeah there's people that are um, lawyers <laughs> that are flight attendants on their days off people that um, because once you once you get to be able to hold a schedule then you can easily work two jobs a lot of the pilots um, maybe started construction companies or ran large farms or, you know, did other jobs and they actually had another job. Maybe some of them sold real estate or, or, were, or were real estate brokers. Um, so there, because our job allows us to bid our schedule, to bid our days off, it, it's kind of like, well, I want to bid to work my other job Monday through Friday. So I'll work Saturday, Sundays, or, you know, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of different jobs. Uh, I worked with um, several uh, advanced trauma and cardiac care nurses 
they were at top of the line in their field. Uh, but they're, because they were a lot senior, they had maybe, you know, 30 years seniority, they could bid to fly a low schedule. When I say low schedule, maybe, you know, 67 hours or maybe 70 hours a month flying, which they could accomplish in just a couple, two or three trips. But then also they have the benefits of the airlines. Uh, I, I'm curious, what are the benefits? I mean, what, I mean, we hear that flight attendants, they can fly wherever they want for, you know, next to nothing. But be a little more specific as to what an airline person can do, both pilots and, and do pilots have more benefits than flight attendants? Well, no, and it's kind of a misnomer that you fly for free, although you kind of can if you want to fly on a jump seat, but that's not the most comfortable way to go. But um, but it's kind of more of a guarantee where you can go. And um, prior to 9-11, uh, the pilots actually could pretty much get on and ride in a jump seat in the cockpit if there was a jump seat open and you could uh, reserve those. Uh, a lot of airlines changed all of that after 9-11, so I don't know what they're doing, which each airline's doing now. But um, in general, uh, flight attendants and pilots both have, both have the same travel benefits, and that would be the company would set a, a, a price tag on a domestic flight. Say you, uh, you could go from anywhere you wanted from A to B uh, on a ticket that cost you a set price. If you were in coach, it may be, you know, 15 or $20. Or uh, if you were in first class or business class, it would be a little bit more. So, and you could go, if you went international, then there's another um, bracket where that would go. So an air, every airline's a little bit different, but usually you have to pay a very nominal fee. I know a lot of people years ago, you say, oh, you just pay the taxes. I don't know if it worked out that we just had a, a standard. Most airlines have like a standard fee for coach or, or first class. Now, I have a niece who works in the airline. I think she's a reservation agent, but her parents are allowed to fly on that particular airline or some airlines. I don't know. But uh, my my sister actually has the ability to, to fly and she uses that because her daughter is working with the airline right. how does that work well the same uh, airline people it doesn't matter what you do for the airline you all have the same flight benefits in general except ground people can't sit in the cockpit and uh other people only flight attendants can sit on a flight attendant jump seat for example i think that's probably system-wide across the country um so if you're a reservations agent or you're a ramp person or a ticket agent uh or a flight attendant or a pilot uh, you or a mechanic. There's a mechanics too. Uh, you can you get the same benefits. So on your days off, and everybody gets to bid their schedule to kind of build what days they want to work, and it all centers around seniority. And so that's why, um, as far as the 9/11 thing goes, there was some red flags for me because a lot of the people that were involved in the crew were not senior enough to hold a schedule. And one of the things about that particular, those particular flights that were transcontinental flights over to California, uh, spending the, the night, coming back the next day, a two day trip, transcontinental is quite senior, especially on a Tuesday, Wednesday. Now I've heard you mention, you know, not being able to hold a schedule. I, I'm a little confused. What does that really mean? And, you know, if you're a junior person just starting out, you know, you've been a flight attendant for a week and a half and you're bidding, but you're bidding against all these people that are far more senior than you. What kind of schedule are you going to have at that point? And how long does it take you to get to where you basically can, you know, fly to London once a week and, you know, that's your schedule or fly to Japan once a week. And, uh, you know, you don't have to do the crappy little uh, puddle jumpers. Well, that, uh, again, varies by the airline, the type of flying that they do. and Because some airlines just fly domestic, one type of aircraft. For instance, Southwest Airlines. They only fly the 737 uh, and inside the United States. I don't know that they're doing any international stuff. They may. I don't fly, so they I may think, have I think picked maybe up they go to Mexico they and stuff. They may have stuff, but picked up something like that now. They certainly don't fly to China yet. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so if you're uh, like United or American, you can fly domestic. You can be a flight attendant and or you can be a purser. And so you can fly international. 
And what happens is, depending upon the size of your base and the seniority of that base, for example, if you're in Los Angeles or you're in San Francisco, it's a more senior base with every company than, say, Newark. And you would be in the most junior base at a place like Newark. And um, maybe Dallas-Fort Worth would be the next most junior base. So do you get to decide where your base is or does the airline assign you a particular base? Initially, when you get out of training, you're assigned a base and then you can go through the system as you've been employed and you have now a seniority date and a seniority number, you can request to be uh, transferred when spots open up. Let's just say you're... Uh, you're out of training and you're based in New York and it's very expensive and you're not making very much money and you got 12 roommates in a one bedroom studio apartment. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that you kind of have to go through at the beginning. And you really want to be based in San Francisco, but the most junior person in San Francisco has been flying for 18 years. I, and I kid you not, that could be the case. So it's going to take you a long time to get there. So your next best bet would be to get into, you know, another base. Let's just say, you know, Chicago. And you think, well, I've got an ant there. It's not too bad. I don't mind winters. I really like the pizza, you know. So you'll put in for that. And then, you know, spend time there if you don't want to be in New York. And then just wait until the position opens up. So if you are a, a very junior person and you're based in New Newark or someplace around the the uh, New York metropolitan area, what kind of flights are you, are you going to be able to take uh, and bid for and and hold? I mean, you say you can't fly Los or you can't fly from Newark to Los Angeles uh, if you've only been a flight attendant for six months to a year as a schedule. As a schedule, so you could fly it as a reservist though. And every airline. What's the difference? Well, every airline is different. Once you have enough seniority to hold a flight schedule, then you can go in and air, it, it's usually there's a there's every airline's a little bit different on this, but you usually go into a computer system and you bid and say, I want to fly this particular uh, pattern or sequence, which would be say flight 11 out, flight 12 back in, using the 911 stuff uh, on. Tuesday and Wednesday, and that would that particular um, sequence would be uh, given a number, and then you would bid to have you know I want that number on that day. It's like a trip number. And but then, if somebody more senior than you bids the exact same thing, you get kicked out. Right. You have to have enough seniority. If there's you know let's say flight eleven had nine uh, flight attendants on board, so if you're in the top nine in seniority, then you can hold that. But if you're, you know, number 25, you don't get it. You're not going to hold that particular trip. A, a certain trips are more senior than others. For instance, usually going outbound on a Tuesday is a lighter load. So it's less work. And that usually goes more senior, which was uh, the case on 9-11. So that's kind of how that works. It's kind of complicated. Uh, and every airline's just a little bit different how they do it, but it's kind of a, it's like a, I looked at it like it's a wish list. And depending upon how much seniority you have, uh, you can pick a better trip. Now you were asking me about how, what kind of trip can you first fly uh, as a schedule when you're junior? Well, a lot of times those are trips that are like six stops a day on a smaller aircraft, an RJ or a, a 737 or something like that, and you literally would make five or six stops a day and have a very short layover in domestically and then get up and do it again, and that might be a four days in a row of that. That's hard flying. So one of the things that I've heard you say is that on 9-11, there were a number of really junior flight attendants that had no business being on that particular flight because really flying on say flight 11, you know, cross country like that, was a really senior position. Somebody had to have been in the airlines for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years to be able to hold that. Is that, is that what you're, is that correct? Yeah, I would say, you know, I'm going to guess with both of the, both of the airlines involved, maybe a dozen years, 10 to 12, maybe, uh, you could hold, be a junior. <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, some of the people that were crew members had 30 plus years or so. So how do you explain the fact that people that had been flying for a year or less were actually uh, crewed to fly those planes that day? I mean, how do you explain it? Well, I'm not positive that I have an explanation other than they needed, some of them needed to be there. And so, uh, and that goes a little bit deeper than I'm willing to go at this particular time because I'm still diving into um, to, into that. And I'm really going to cover it in depth in the nonfiction book. So. But logically, they shouldn't have been and couldn't have been there. That's correct. Right? That's correct. And, and there were... So there's a red flag. There were more than 50% of the flight attendants that got a last minute call that were, that had similarities. They got a last minute call and they didn't have enough seniority to get there and that's a real high rate for a reservist to be called in or last minute replacements but 50 percent is a lot uh for the of, now that of the whole i think there were flight 25 flight attendants and at least 13 or 14 were last minute call-ups and they also had some interesting history that that kind of correlates together so typically maybe uh five percent two percent you know that that are last minute call-ups that are reservists that are going to fly now, these are people, let's say somebody calls in sick and says, you know, that had bid the thing, uh, bid a flight, and they'd been around for a long time and they could hold it, but they called in sick. And so the scheduler is going to call a reservist, maybe. That's right. That's how it would work. And, and you say 50% is just way out of the standard deviation for that. So what is exactly. the typical? You uh, might you know, have one or two. One or two instead of... Uh, 15 or 20. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 13 or 14 out of the 25. So the alarm bells are going. Yeah, well, and that's one of the interesting things about 9-11 is that the <clears throat> most of the pilots were all last minute call ups. And, and that gets kind of complicated. And again, I'm going to cover it in the nonfiction. But um, once you've been assigned a trip and it's on your schedule, whether and also this works for a reserve, when you are on reserve, it's on call. Uh, you're, you're on call to be called up to crew any aircraft that you're qualified on. Now, some airlines, uh, you have to qualify, for instance, to fly over water. So if, to, if a flight to Hawaii opened up and you weren't qualified, they would go down to the next person that was over water qualified. So there's different uh, positions like that that come into play a little bit too. But it still all goes down the line in seniority order. So if your um, number is up, so to speak, and the flight opens up and they need you and you're qualified on that aircraft, they will call you up and say, you're going to go on this trip, but they're not going to then, once they give it to you, take it away for any reason, which is another thing we saw in 9-11. Now, also, now I want to know about the pilots, for example. If you, you become a pilot, and I assume when you start out, you're a very junior pilot and you're in the right seat, meaning you're the co-pilot. And, uh, you know, you work your way up and the object is to get into the left seat, become a pilot. Now, are there left seat pilots that are less senior than co-pilots? Does that happen? Or, I mean, or does it work up? I mean, how does that work? If you're a co-pilot, you become a, a, a pilot and everybody else is a, below you as a co-pilot? Am I making sense? No. <laughs> but but it is it's a very confusing thing. So let me try to make it make sense to you because it is kind of confusing. Seniority on an aircraft for the pilots is left seat as the captain or right seat as the first officer or the co-pilot. So those are two different positions. After you get qualified to become a captain, once you get enough seniority to be a captain, and then you've got the ladder of the different aircraft. And each aircraft uh, usually holds a different pay rate. So what would what did everybody want to do? They want to get the, the longer trips, the higher pay. And so that's kind of the drive in general. But there are, there's always going to be people that want to stick to flying a 737 because that's the plane they love and they don't want to get into a 777 or a 767 or even the 757. Okay, now let, that's a let me, let me see if I can explain this. Let's say I join the airline as a pilot in January and you join the airline as a pilot in uh, June. So we're six months apart, but I'm more senior than you. 
because I've been there six months longer. Now, could you become a, and we're both flying in the right seat and just having a grand old time. Could you become a pilot before me? A captain. I mean, a captain before me? If I, if I went to a different airplane, an aircraft, and you stayed on one, you could probably do that. Because there's there's not just the left and right seat. There's different airplanes that people will qualify okay. on. So if you're qualified as a 737 captain and you wish to stay there, or you're qualified as a 737 uh, first officer or co-pilot, and you decide, I love this position. You don't have to ever be the captain, but the ego usually drives you to it. And then the paycheck gets bigger. Would I still be more senior than you, even if you became a captain? Well, and I see, was that's where seniority splits away from because you're talking apples and oranges. The captain's an apple, the first officer's an orange. And then when you throw in the fruit basket of the 737, 747, 757, 67, 77, <laughs> and then the Airbuses and all the different aircraft. So it, it's very, very complicated. I think I've made my point to you on that. Uh, however, the most important thing, I, I relate, I'm trying to relate this back to 9-11 now. The most important thing, I think, uh, in 9-11 is that uh, there were several pilots that had bid to fly those flights that were removed by the company without explanation. And that does not happen just as the captains that were called up at the last minute, even though they bid to have September 11th off because they had a party planned or they had a... Uh, some kind of big meeting planned or something on their farm planned or something like that. Or they're going to the dentist. Or the dentist. You never know. I mean, it's a, you bid your days off and they're yours. And so uh, all of those uh, pilots on 9-11 were senior enough to not ever have the company call them up and say, oh, we're going to make you fly on your day off because that doesn't happen. So who did call them? That's the question that everybody should be asking. Who made that phone call? When was the decision made to pull this off, uh, the whole 9-11 event? Um, because there was a lot of scrambling done, and there were a lot of people that were taken off the trips that shouldn't have been. We talk about a, a purser uh, in Methodical Illusion. There's a story about a purser who was commuted. Now, it's common. That's why I'm going to talk about that for a few seconds. It's common for us because we begin, after you get in there for a year or two, you start looking at an airplane and you start looking, oh, New York to Miami, that's only three hours. Hey, what the heck? I can do that. You start to look at um, airplanes as buses. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can commute to Paris. We, I actually flew with people that commuted from Europe, uh, several cities in Europe, uh, to several cities uh, in the United States. As a commute, they would come into the United States and bid to fly their flying back to back. In between, they'd stay in hotels, uh, commuter hotels or a commuter apartment with other uh, airline people and get their flying done in you know nine or 10 days. And then they'd go back to Europe and live. So let me make, let's make sure I understand this. If I, did, if I was a pilot, you know, a left seat pilot with lots of seniority and I'd bid to fly from um, Boston to San Francisco or Boston to Los Angeles. And that's my schedule and I'm going to hold it. And all of a sudden the airline calls up and says, you know, Ramjet, you're out. We're putting Rebecca Roth in. She's going to fly that. Uh, that's, you mentioned that that's just absolutely uh, highly unusual. It doesn't happen. If that had happened, I would have had the right to pitch a holy tizzy fit, right? Yeah, there's um, union contracts that cover stuff like that. So there's an agreement with the company. When I bid to have my, my flying or my days off, such and such, when I bid to have that off or to have, to have my schedule on such a flight or what have you, that's mine in my seniority order. The company cannot come at you and say, I mean, they, they can do that if there's some weird thing. For instance, after 9-11, we had airplanes parked all around the world with no crews because everybody had been sitting for, you know, five or 10 days or longer uh, trying to get, you know, flights, 
passengers, crew members, everybody going. So everybody kind of did something very different. But that's about the only time I can think of in my 30 plus years that things were not as they should be. And you really didn't have the ability because everything wasn't up and running. So it was very unusual. But prior to 9-11, on September 10th, if you were a pilot and you were on a schedule to fly that, the company would not change that for you. And that happened. So if that was my situation and they changed that and I'm ready to pitch a holy tizzy fit and I'm all ready to just absolutely come unhinged and then I find out the plane flew into a building and everybody died, I'm not quite as upset as I might have ordinarily been. Probably right? wouldn't have filed a grievance on that. Exactly. But And there are pilots that have come out now and and spoken about it. And keep in mind that after... Uh, 9-11, I think that a lot of people that should have been or were supposed to be or at the last minute didn't get on or last minute had their trip removed from them have now uh, had to deal with the survivor's guilt. And, and because they, a lot of them don't know the truth of what really happened that day, uh, they don't know that some of those crew members were allowed to live. Um, so they, they're still suffering from the survivor guilt. Uh, and yeah, they didn't complain, but that that was not a customary, uh, understood event. And I know I can think of one of the captains who um, had a very large event going. Had people coming in from foreign countries, uh, from Asia, visiting his farm. And in the last minute, uh, the the afternoon or early evening of the September tenth, uh, he got a phone call. We don't know who called him. And he was told he had to be on um, one of those flights. And uh, his wife actually was a flight attendant, so she would know that that's not right. Um, but she just kind of went away. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to question it. But then again, it, afterwards, you know, a lot of those uh, pilots and flight attendants were um, uh, raised up as heroes. Oh, they were just flying a trip. Uh, they didn't do anything right, so I'm not. I never could figure out why they were heroes because they never followed protocol. They didn't do. If they were heroes, here's what would happen: the uh, hijackers would have been taken out, killed, incapacitated, one in one or the other. The planes would have landed safely, and we would still have those people with us today. That's a successful hijacking. And that's what the protocols were, were made to do. And that's why when they didn't follow protocol, people started wondering why they didn't. And if you look at that, uh, I think it's pretty clear now that we know what we've learned in book four, uh, why this was a success in some people's eyes, but not in others, because maybe the whole idea of the success was pulling off something that looked like what they showed us. A uh, bit of a hoax. So there you go. Well, that's uh, We're going to end this one right here. And this will be number uh, number one. And then we'll be uh, just going to continue this on. We're going to talk about so you guys can understand a lot of stuff. We'll talk a, a lot about everything that came through all four books. All right. Part two of the Christmas special. <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, continue on talking about uh, a little bit about the airline stuff. Oh, I thought so. Ramjet was going to sing Jingle Bells. <laughs> Maybe later. Maybe at the very end. Okay, so what I want to talk, uh, kind of explain to you this time on, on this one is about uh, the first half of Methodical Illusion. And why did I write that the way it was? You know, I decided that um, the best way to, to in, introduce all the information that I'd uncovered uh, just in my research about 9-11 and a lot of it was open source stuff that had been out there. But one of the things I had to do was also to weed through this crazy conspiracy theories. And a lot of them were uh, written by uh, people that have uh, maybe never flown <laughs> or only flown a half a dozen times in their life, but haven't done it professionally. Didn't know what uh, an airline, how an airline operates or what we do. And so if you think about this in the first half or so of Methodical Illusion, I take you into the catacombs of 
uh, the airline where the gl glamour hides from you. You don't get to see it. <laughs> it's where we go to check in. And what I wanted to do was explain to you so that you would understand this too. So when you see some goofy professor talking about flight attendants being kidnapped and voice morphed and all this nonsense, you will understand how it works. So I want to kind of explain a little well, bit well, about Well, basically, that. when you were talking about, uh, you know, back in the catacombs, I don't think there was any glamour there, was there? I mean, the couches <laughs> were all, the tables and chairs were kind of a mess, uh, you know, been around since about 1430. And, you know, there's newspapers all over the place. I don't know if that's where the glamour hides. Make you can sure tell I was being facetious, make, right? <laughs> make sure I don't ever get invited okay, well, down there. Here's the funny thing, because all uh, airlines are kind of the same. That I, I've probably had at least a half a dozen or more different airline uh, employee company people uh, say, did you fly for A, B, or C? Uh, because that's exactly what our office was like. Um, so just so you understand how this works, and it's not always the same. I, one of my offices was located uh, in the uh, in a different area than this, but this is often the case, um, is that, and the reason for that is that there's these offices down uh, underneath the terminal. Uh, and that's on the same level as the tarmac. And there's reasons for that. And it does all make really good sense because the, the luggage handlers, the mechanics, the operation dispatchers, the, um, we all have access to the tarmac by an outside stairs that leaves the jetway. If you get to the airplane and you look off to your right, there's usually on, usually on the right, sometimes it'll be on the left, but oftentimes it's on the right. And you know, there's a door there before you get onto the airplane. You see the airplane doors open. And if you look on both sides, you'll find a door. It looks like, um, it has a window in it, uh, a door and it. And that door opens to a stairs. And so we would, be able to come and go. The pilots can access to do their walk around, pre their pre-flight walk around. We always joke that they would just go down and kick the tires. That's not all they would do, but uh, to you know, make sure that everything was good. There weren't um, holes, or we hadn't hit a bird, or there wasn't something wrong with uh, you know missing bolts or something. <laughs> Flat tires, yeah, and that could be those because they they get found too. Uh, sometimes uh, tires will go flat on a landing, so. Before the plane takes off, oh, one of the pilots has to go and do a walk around. And that's how they get down there. So it does make sense that, you know, offices are often down there and they're often, you know, not the fanciest places. So, and that, and they're, we don't, we don't stay down there very long uh, if, unless you're waiting for a, a flight to go somewhere and you don't want to sit in the terminal. Um, you can sit down in a, in a crew lounge area. So, let me just tell you what would happen just so you guys know, because I, I think that it's important that we dispel some of the conspiracies and why you understand that this is kind of how this works. If you as a flight attendant have been given a flight, whether you bid for it on your schedule or you were on reserve or picked it up off of some sort of open flying system, like there's if, and if there's crew positions open because the flight becomes full or because somebody's sick, there's a position, um, an open board or a uh, open flying system where you could go in and if you needed to build up your schedule because maybe you'd gotten sick or you make an up sick time or wanted extra flying time that month, you could go in and say, oh, there's an open trip right there. I'll pick that up. If you have the seniority, when you go in and request it, it works usually that way. Um, so let's just say you've got a trip on your schedule on September 11th and your departure time is 8 a.m. Well, what happens, and I think this is important that people understand, is that, and it, it depends on the airline you're with and the, the, um, time. So don't hold me. This is not, if it, United's a little bit different or American's a little bit different or Southwest's a little bit different, every airline's a little bit different, but just to give you an example, if your departure with your passengers on board and the door shut is at 8 a.m., you need to be on that airplane 45 minutes to an hour before departure. So you've got to be on the plane, let's just say one hour before, at, at 7 a.m. Now the plane is leaving from the terminal 
And inside that terminal is your offices, your in-flight uh, services offices where the flight attendants check in. But before you leave your house, you have a two-hour check-in call. So at 6 a.m., if not sooner, because sometimes it takes longer to fly or to drive to the airport. So you, by minimum of two hours, or maybe it's two and a half for a different airline, but let's just say two hours, you have to call crew scheduling and say, uh, this is Rebecca Roth. My, num my employee number is 12678859, and I'm on uh, sequence pattern number uh, 122 which is flight 11. And he says, okay, you're checked in. That's two hours before departure. If I don't make that call, they'll call a reserve to replace me and I'm in trouble. So I, I know that we, everybody just thinks that we're part of the airplane, but we're not. <laughs> so that's kind of how that works. So if you know you're leaving on an 8 a.m. departure and you've got a two hour drive or maybe bad weather, it's two and a half or three hour drive, you could call in at five in the morning and check in and say, I'm on my way. Then you need to be in the uh, check-in lounge or at the offices where you're signing in or uh, computer checking in. You're just typing your name and your number and your pattern number, sequence number uh, into a computer system or talking to a human. Sometimes there and there's that, that too. They're there. You have supervisors there. They give you your paperwork for your flight. Uh, they Then you go into a, usually a briefing room oftentimes and you will meet the rest of your crew. These could be people you've never seen in your life. These are people that have had the same training as you. They may have flown for uh, six months or they may have flown for 40 years. Uh, everybody's got a seniority number and, and the work position inside the airplane, however many, if you're on a double aisle airplane like a 767 and there's maybe nine crew members, then you've got a purser and they'd be the purser position and then in seniority order, people choose what they like to work. Now, some people really like the aft galley they just like to be organized and do the food stuff. Some people prefer a beverage cart and a, a meal cart, and they like to do it in a certain section of the airplane. So if they have enough seniority to hold their favorite position, that's how they bid to work a, p a particular position. Some people prefer to sit in the aft three right jump seat, for example, like Betty Ong did. So that's what happens. So you literally have uh, from five or six in the morning, three, let's just say roughly say three, two to three hours before your scheduled departure with passengers on board and the door shut, you're talking to people at crew scheduling who are writing you down into the computer with here's the important thing that was never ever mentioned by any crew member on 9-11. And you heard me say it. This is Rebecca Roth and I'm, and my employee number is 1-877-654-321 and I'm checking in for such and such a sequence. Anytime an employee from an airline talks to anybody in the airline, they give their employee number with their name every stinking time. And that's the one thing that we never saw anybody do on 9-11. And there's no reason they didn't. That's a logical reason. So you see how hard it would be to be uh, kidnapped, right? Most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time our offices are located on the secure side of security. Or they're in a, uh, uh, if they're not on the secure side of security, they're on, let's just say I can think of a, one office. It was a mezzanine level, ab above the ticket counter level. There's a mezzanine level where you had to know the code to get in, uh, the elevator to move up to that level. And then you had to know the specific uh, code to get into the office. So only airline employees, or in, in this case, only flight attendants uh, for and the, our support um, so supervisors and that sort of thing could get into those offices. So they were they were particu particularly on the right on the secure side of security, but they were in secure secure uh, offices. So you, nobody could just come in and grab you <laughs> because they'd have to have all the codes to get in, and there were different codes to get into uh, the elevator and also to in the specific specific, specific office that you had. So. The idea of somebody kidnapping an entire crew member, and that's one thing I wanted to do when I brought Vera into a meeting uh, and where she waited and met uh, Grace Lewis, was that she was sitting down there in kind of the catacombs waiting area where the vending machines are and 
you know, there's old newspapers or magazines that maybe were torn and, and they were from the airplane, but some little child got into them and ripped them. Well, rather than throw them away, they'll throw them down into the crew lounge area where we sit and wait for, you know, to go crew a flight or go commute on a flight. So if somebody were going to hijack or kidnap, I should say, if somebody were going to kidnap an entire crew, it would be kind of like herding cats. Uh, you know, or I can just imagine, you know, it's it's, it's like, actually impossible. It's like like you would see, uh, you know, sometimes mothers have ch children with harnesses on in the grocery store. And so you'd have nine or 10 or 15 flight attendants with their little harnesses on. That's how you would go about hijacking them, right? Well, it's in other words, it is impossible. It is impossible. It, it's such a ludicrous idea. Uh, and that's when I realized that there were that the 9-11 uh, event was filled with, uh, I can think of three right off the top of my head, of professors that had no idea how we go to work and what happens when we uh, go to work and how in touch we are with the airline. I, I mean, they just had no idea. And so that was such a ludicrous um, conspiracy theory that I just, I, when I found that, I thought, oh my God, this is crazy. What else don't they know? And what else do they think? Um, so I, and I, I just wanted to kind of dispel that because it's not just like we just, you know, throw on our uniform and decide to go to an airport terminal and get on a plane. That's not how it works. It's very organized. And by the way, we bid for our schedule like a month in advance. So by the, usually by the 20th or maybe the 23rd of November, let's say, we'll know exactly what our schedule is for the month of December. And then same for January, we will know by a certain, there's a bid cutoff date and somewhere usually between the 18th and the 24th of the month prior, and then you'll know. Now in a methodical illusion, you know, you paint the picture of uh, an airplane flying into the Patriot Hotel and the First Lady essentially is killed. Now that's obviously uh, just part of the novel. That didn't really happen. We don't have a First Lady that was killed in Las Vegas. But then you follow that up because Vera is flying back from Japan and she's landing. Uh, I don't remember exactly where she was uh, you know, land, coming into, but she has a, a security briefing. It, how realistic is that? Well, you know, I put that in there so that people could understand um, initially, and especially if you're flying, you're, you know, seven miles off the surface. Those In those days, in 2001, we didn't have any Wi-Fi on board. So we were really out of touch. If cell phones didn't work, especially in her case, she was flying in from uh, Asia. It's a long flight, 10, 12 hours, 14 hours. It depends upon, you know, where you're leaving from and where you're landing at. But, you know, roughly 12 hours in the air without knowing what's happening on the surface of the earth. So you don't know if there's been a, a volcano eruption or <laughs> an earthquake or you just are detached from the news because we didn't have Wi-Fi in those times. So what happened uh, when there was an incident uh, what I wanted to do was kind of show people how long it takes for everybody in the airline. And we had a saying, let the press be damned. Uh, we, the companies, every company has a, a, a spokesperson that speaks to the press about any event. We don't. Not the baggage handlers, not the ticket agents, not the flight attendants, not the pilots. None of us are to speak to the press. And so I wanted to... Uh, kind of bring in how out of touch you are when you come in from a long flight like that. Something in, has happened involving your company, and yet you're going to walk through the airport terminal to commute home, uh, like Vera was commuting back to the West Coast in her uniform, and you know, you're going to get asked questions. Strangers are going to stop you and say, oh, you're with the airline involved in that incident. What happened? And stuff like that. So I wanted to kind of just portray two things there that uh, they didn't quite have all the details to give any details to the crew that had come in. Again, to remind them, let the press be damned. Don't talk to anybody. We have spokespersons that do that. And how it affected people emotionally, that they lost uh, a plane 
full of passengers and crew members that we all probably knew it to one degree or the other. Um, sometimes you fly, if you particularly fly a Friday, Saturday, Sunday trip, and you're with other moms that want to fly Friday, Saturday, Sunday trip, because that gives them the rest of the week to get their kids to, you know, football practice or ballet lessons or, you know, whatever, pick up their kids at school and take them, you know, as we do as parents. So it's oftentimes if you're flying one particular sequence or pattern, A to B, on certain days, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, you'll be flying with the same people. But that's not always the case. You know, it's oftentimes you'll get on, you won't know anybody in your crew, you've never seen them before in your life. And even flying 30 years, um, you could get on an airplane uh, with a dozen other people and never have flown with one of them before. Well, one of the other things I thought you did really well in that book is you made it uh, known to the reader that flight attendants and pilots, it's all one big family. It's not like a football team. It's not like the Giants against the uh, jets. I mean, you don't root for one and not the other. So if you're from American or United or Delta or wherever you're from, if something bad happens to one of the those particular airlines, you all feel it. Is that right? Oh, yeah. It is a huge family. And it's funny because now, um, you know, I've, I've since I've written the books, I've become friends with uh, lots of of family members, crew members from all over, all, all kinds of airlines, all over. Uh, we do, we all kind of talk the same language and we all have had the same experiences. For example, uh, just the other night, I have a friend that uh, had flown in and has an hour and a half drive home. So we did a FaceTime audio and talked, literally talked the whole way, uh, her commute home uh, driving. She'd flown in from uh, Europe and, uh, now that I, that I got off the phone, I, only two flight attendants could do that, like we just did. And the time just flew. Um, and then we really were just, we were talking, we were talking about lots of different things. But, uh, you know, for me, I can sit back and I'm so glad I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, but I, I can relate to every experience that she had uh, on her flight and on the layover. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And it doesn't matter if you're in Australia, Australia or uh England or Germany, we can all talk the same language. Uh, we do talk the same language. We are one big family. And so whenever something happens, like 9-11 happened, I wasn't working for one of the airlines that it happened uh, to, um, but we were all involved and we were all uh, touched much more so than uh, the passengers because it was, it was our life. It was our world. And so our world really got changed upside down, backwards and inside out, much more so than you would notice as uh, traveling as a passenger. I know your life's changed a little bit uh, with, you know, having to take off your shoes or your belt or whatever. Um, but ours really, really did, because I think in a lot of aspects, we realized that what we were told and what we'd experienced before uh, when you need jet scrambled, they usually are on your wingtip of six minutes, maybe 10 at the max, uh, to help guide uh, you down and to safety. Um, when we, uh, what we all experienced, I think, collectively uh, across the country was that the, our, what we thought was a safety net, and I covered this in Methodical Deception, uh, when Vera decides it's time to retire, not only was she hooking up with the president who had lost his wife, but uh, it was time to retire because she knew the truth. Well, she knew a lot of it. She didn't know all of it at <laughs> that book, but she knew that uh, the most important thing is that what we were told and shown and what had been the situation in the previous years, and that would be 30 plus years, was that the military was going to scramble and be there and help us and the uh, air traffic control system was set up so that everything, our code words, everything was done right and we practiced all that hijacking protocol every year and that it was going to work because it always worked but didn't get used that day. And what I think a lot of us saw was there was a system that was broken and so we lost a lot of um, hmm, confidence in a way, I guess. And the system that was there to protect our passengers and ourselves. Well, one of the other things I think you brought out in that in that book was, you know, you mentioned, you know, methodical deception and or, or thinking about retiring. But one of the things that, you know, she wasn't able to do was basically look passengers in the face and be yeah. confident with the fact that 
all of our systems are going to work because they didn't work on 9-11. And no explanation why they didn't. There's never been a logical explanation. I remember because I flew for uh, several years afterwards. I never could understand why it was that nobody in air traffic control uh, or in the military, in the Pentagon, nobody lost their job. But on the other hand, most everybody that didn't do their job correctly on that day by scrambling jets immediately, realizing that they had uh, no radio contact with these planes right away. Um, I mean, they didn't understand what was going on. They were totally confused, and they dropped the ball at air traffic control. And instead of losing their jobs, they got promoted. And that's everywhere, from the in the Pentagon, in the military, on up. Uh, that, that Nobody lost their job. And... Um, that was another thing I thought that, but yet they, they built these crew members up to be heroes. And I think, well, how could they be heroes? A hero would have landed the plane and everybody would have got off safely. A hero, a flight attendant hero would have told us how somebody got into the cockpit if they did, but nobody ever said that they did. This was something that we were told, but the flight attendants didn't tell us that. Um, so there was there were things, and then all the three o twos that have been changed. I mean, it, it the story has just absolutely morphed, and and it, I think it started morphing when somebody that day realized that cell phones did not work above about fifteen to eighteen hundred feet elevation, which is like the first three three to five seconds of your flight. Well, you know, as a flight attendant and as a pilot, you know, you fly every week or maybe two or three times a week and you see all kinds of different people. I mean, you probably in your 30 year career, you probably saw 10 million people uh, on, on flights. And yet, you know, you kind of portrayed a sense that you are very protective of those passengers, even though you don't really know them and may never see them again. Um, explain that to me a little bit, you know, the protective nature that pilots and flight attendants have over their passengers, and if there's a problem, your job is to protect them. Well, it's the magic of that uniform, and I think police officers and firefighters uh, understand exactly what I'm saying. Um, you no longer are you're the wife, the sister, the mother. Once you put that uniform on, you've got a whole different ball game going on. You've got a whole different uh, set of priorities. And so we are really literally not just there to serve you a Coke and 7-Up, but we are there to give you CPR, to uh, shock you back to life with a defibrillator, to give you the Heimlich technique, to stop the bleeding if you uh, have an in incident where you know we're in turbulence and all of a sudden you, some part of the ceiling panel falls down and cuts your arm or your leg. Um, if you're choking on food, we can take care of that with the Heimlich technique. If something catches on fire in the cabin, we will put that fire out. We'll be your firefighter. We'll be your nurse. We'll be your psychologist. If you're freaking out because you're scared to death of flying, for whatever reason, we'll set you down in our jump seat and hold your hand so we can do a little bit of jump seat therapy and be your psychologist. And we are a babysitter, and sometimes we have to change people's diapers. Um, we are just everything on that plane because when you're 35,000 feet above the earth, there isn't anybody else to help you but us. But in relation to 9-11, with all the events that were taking place, those feelings and those protective uh, uh, in, innate situations would have transpired even then, no matter what was going on with Arab hijackers or whatever. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Well, if there was, uh, I mean, we had protocols to follow, and that's why I've said this a gazillion times. None of the crew members followed the protocol. And the most interesting thing is, that it's truly, I, it's, I sat in the jump seat so many times that it it was second nature. It was like breathing to me to say jump seat, sit in the jump seat. Betty was sitting in her jump seat, but that's not what she should have done in a real hijacking because the protocol was to sit down and not draw attention to yourself. Look like a passenger and go to sleep. Look like you're asleep. Cover up your uniform. Take off your name tag and your wings. Cover up with a coat or a blanket, even if you have to borrow one from the overhead bin. Leave that hijacker with one flight attendant only. 
that's not what we heard all the crew members walking back and forth we heard betty sitting in her jump seat she should have been in one of the nearly 100 empty passenger seats covered with a blanket she was not only sitting in her jump seat in her uniform talking on a phone that is a great way to get killed but it didn't happen did it not then anyway why she was on the phone for 27 minutes but when you start to look at this and i mean i looked at this for a long time before i realized <laughs> you're supposed to sit down and not draw attention to yourself that doesn't mean sitting in your jump seat that's the last place you would sit you need to sit in a passenger seat so you don't look like a crew member that was our protocol. Now, she'd been flying like roughly 12 years. So she'd gotten that training over and over and over every year. She knew the code words. Uh, maybe the reason that their scenario was painted for them that the pilots weren't answering is because the pilots don't know what's going on in the cabin because we're their eyes and ears. The door is locked. It always was locked. We had the keys uh, to get into the cockpit. And there was only a peak hole for them and they're sitting taken off they're sitting looking forward they're not interested they don't even know what's happening in the cabin unless we tell them and so that's why we had the designated code words and the protocol step by step to let them know there was somebody in the uh, that we would refer to as a hijacker there was no such thing as a terrorist in aviation at the time of 9 11. We would have referred to them as a hijacker and followed the hijack protocol set in stone. None of that happened. Like I said, a successful uh, ending uh, for if they were heroes, they would have told us one, if they were in the cockpit, nobody said they were, uh, people on the ground said they were, but later on we found out that those people worked for the department of defense. Um, there's the story grew legs later on. Um, but they never told us how they got in the cockpit, if they were in the cockpit at all. So uh, they didn't do the right thing. They should have They should have not been. Now, you know that Betty Ong, if you listen to the four and a half minute tape, um, if you listen to that tape, you can hear uh, someone there. She says he's coming back. He is in one hijacker. He's coming back from business. And the flight attendants there, and you can hear a couple flight attendants talking back and forth uh, when she's on hold on the phone. Again, every single flight attendant except the one dealing with the one hijacker would have been sitting down, hiding out, not not drawing attention to you, to themselves, looking like a passenger, preferably asleep. Well, it's now been um, eighteen years, or will be uh, in September of this this next year and it's still that story is still growing legs those legs are so long uh, daddy long legs don't even come close to what it is i mean the the story continues to morph mm -hmm. and you wonder how does that happen how do you get a story that it can't be changed because people are dead or events have come to finality and yet the story continues to change yeah well i guess i revert back to operation mockingbird because the cia did this and the CIA controls the media. So everything that's written or spoken uh, about 9-11 about and why it changes is coming from that same source. So I'm, on that, I'm going to close this one off and try to keep these about a half hour long uh, so that you guys don't spend all your holiday. But, you know, I still want you to give uh, the information. And, um, you know, if there's at the end of this, if you still have questions, put them in the chat room. <laughs>